studios in New York City. This is Charlie Rose. to play the first three notes in the speed and drive and force and power and excitement that you really think they should have. The Mastro is back. James Levine is the music director of the Metropolitan Opera. After missing two seasons due to a spinal cord injury, he returned to the Met last month to conduct one of his favorite operas, Mozart's Casi Fan Tutte. The Associated Press writes that Levine led his beloved musicians like a man rejuvenated. Here's a look. James Levine has been a major force at the Met for more than 40 years, conducting some 2,500 performances and shaping the way opera sounds. The New York Times calls him, quote, one of the greatest living conductors. This season he will also conduct a new production of Falstaff and a revival of Wazek. I am pleased to have him, very pleased to have him back at this table. Welcome. Thanks, Charlie. It's great to see you. It really is good. You look great. I feel great. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about what you've been through and what you've learned. <laughs> is that the happiest time for you? You're in that orchestra pit. You are conducting genius, Mozart. Yes. I would say it, it doesn't get happier than yeah. that. I mean, that's that to be doing what you're cut out to do where yeah. what you have the talent for the drive for the wish for and especially uh in under miraculous circumstances it was um it, it was an amazing feeling it always is and it must be especially amazing if you did not know whether you would ever be able to do that well it's just, you, you i fell and i my back i had had terrible trouble with my back i was in tremendous pain, nothing seemed to cure it, and I had to have surgery. And once the surgery was finished and I was out of pain, it was successful, I fell. And when I fell, yeah. I didn't disturb the surgery, but I wound up with a, a major spinal cord injury, which uh, meant that uh, I, I really couldn't move some things, I couldn't move my legs, and gradually, through a care, really caring treatment and therapy and rehab, all, all this, and, it gradually comes back, and I'm able to work again. And my my colleagues tell me, and I can hear from the audience, that they're not relating it to the way I was um, before I had to stop because of the the uh, fall, but to years before when I really had the the vitality and I wasn't in any pain. And you I'm feel still that not yourself. Yes, you absolutely. That. There's there's no no doubt about it. I just don't have pain. I get a, a twinge here or there and it's gone, but I don't have anything, no, nothing like a chronic pain anywhere. But did you doubt that you might not ever stand there or yes, sit there it, again? Yes, it's hard. If, when you're lying in a hospital bed and you look down at your legs and you can't move them, you think to yourself, well, yeah, I could conduct with my upper body, but I wouldn't have been able to conduct with you know, without uh, feeling some kind of flow through the whole thing, because you, you conduct with your body on some level or other, even though it is possible to conduct just fine sitting down. Many people do. But luckily, 
uh, the return started to come and the the surgery held and the nerves um, began to come back. Nerves do it on their own time. But I worked hard on the muscles so that I'd have a possibility for the nerves to hook up again. And the therapists have got me now walking in a walker um, carefully. And recently I started to climb upstairs, wow. which is, uh, you know, was unthinkable when I was lying there and I couldn't move them. Did you learn something from this experience? Well, you learn millions of things. First of all, I didn't know that I could work again. And I thought to myself, I always thought I was the luckiest guy in the world. And I would had 40 years at the Met and 50 years of of musical professional musical activity and I thought well if if I'm supposed to stop now I will and and what can you do and I I would have pursued um, other aspects of music the there are many things that interest me of course but uh, I don't know I I suppose as I I found that the my body began to respond and I was encouraged to work harder and harder at the uh, at the rehab. Um, the feeling that I wouldn't be able to do it just disappeared. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is a triumph of the human spirit. And no, no that's doubt what about it's it. about. And there's one other thing that, that is really important in this case. For the entire time, I got messages and, and letters and phone calls and, and vibrations, not just from, from my loved ones and my friends and from the company, but from the public, from people I don't even know. Who, and I'd, I'd go in the, in the park and, and hide in my, in my wheelchair and people would just, on their bikes, go by and say words of encouragement. And I felt more a part of the community even than I ever had before, though I've lived here all my adult life. You know, life. it's a great feeling because you realize that you touch people's lives that you don't really know. You know the music, you know the audience in the hall, uh, and you know the critics who, who say good things. But you realize when you're in a place where you are, that what you do connects to their life. It brings something special. I never realized it to that extent. I was moved so much by their their presence. They, they all said the same thing. Come back, we need you, whatever it takes. You have said, and I think you're saying here, that you found yourself psychologically in a state that was was even better than before you were injured. I mean, not just as your best when you were young, right. but even a better place. Yes, it was. It was better because I had all that experience and I'd been through all that, and then I, and I'd had this experience which stopped me cold, and f two years of not conducting when I had conducted all my life, and uh, so it it, it was. I think, I mean, it's a misfortune to have a spinal cord injury, but I learned so much from the doctors and therapists and the whole teams of people who were working with spinal cord patients, a world I might never have known at all. And when I went back to working, I started off in the second year of my rehab. I didn't, wasn't ready to conduct yet, but I went back working with the young artists in our young artist program. Yeah. and. This was, was so thrilling. I think as I get older, I feel it's a more important, more and more important part of our work to pass on our experience exactly. to the next generation. And uh, there, I, I got sort of back into it that way. And uh, the, I, I really still feel like I'm living in a dream and I, that I got out of that nightmare I was in. Yeah. Uh, 70 is not old for a conductor. No. Is that because music just makes you young? Well, it, largely. It, I think it has to do with something in, uh, apparently, the way most conductors work. There's a lot of... It's the of, movement of hands. Right, a and, lot of know, body exercise, right, a right. lot of this, and that's very good for you. And it makes you tired, so you sleep. And um, I think... Most conductors who died before living to a ripe old age either had some congenital ailment or they smoked 
c yeah. continuously, and then, so they got smoke-related things. Yeah. When you went, I, I think, at, to Carnegie Hall was May 2013. Tell me about that. You mean the first concert? Yes. That, oh, this was unbelievable. This was like you dream something positive, and then it happens even more in reality than you could dream. And, and Charlie, I'm not, I don't go through life sentimental all yeah. the time. I, I really don't. But there was no way I could be in that experience and not feel touched and moved. It was right where I live. It was, there it was, my Met Orchestra, which I hadn't worked with in two years. There it was, music that we never played before, but music that I'd done often and wanted to play with them. And, uh, and there was that, that audience there giving us every, every bit of concentration and support and love and, and uh, excitement. And, uh, and it, it helps enormously because now we have to put a lot of things back together that, that sort of had to stop or diffuse over the two years. And we had plenty of things that were moving forward at the time when I had to suddenly stop. Mm -hmm. You you found music when you were very young. Yes, I did. Or music found you. Music found me. I I apparently could sing before I could talk properly. Oh, I tell her that story. It's amazing. Well, it, my my dad used to sing songs to me, and um, I apparently <clears throat> could remember the tunes and carry them. I'm told long before I could speak coherently, which. Um, Someone, some people would say I still can't <laughs> yeah, speak coherently, but at least it got better. But it was, it was. I thought, perhaps they thought you had a speech impediment. I did have, and what, and that was interesting because the doctor, when my parents called a very remarkable pediatrician who had been my doctor since I was born, um, I was born prematurely, and the. Uh, my parents were very worried, and the doctor said, there's nothing wrong with that baby, he's just little, and I don't want to hear one word from you until he's three years old about how he's not keeping pace with the other kids. And, of course, um, it, it was, we saw what happened. In fact, it didn't, didn't matter, but uh, people didn't know that then. But this, this doctor was very perceptive. And when I was three... I used to walk by the piano and reach up and, and bang on it. Yeah. And when my mother complained to the doctor about my speech impediment, the doctor said, what's he interested in? Yeah. And mother said, well, he bangs on the piano. He said, piano lessons. And they started me with piano lessons and that sort of, my speech impediment it, it went, went away. away. Yeah, it did. It's stunning, isn't it? Yep. And then on, you were on stage when you were 10, weren't you? Yes, I, I made my right. debut as a pianist with my hometown symphony, the Cincinnati Symphony, when I was 10. Yeah. And I'd already played piano recitals in the, uh, in the studio of my teacher before that. But it is true, music found you. I mean, you were there. This, this thing that would shape your life and bring you so much joy. I'm just one of these people who was able to do exactly what I was best cut out to do. And um, I mean, who had the chance to do it. And I was lucky in every way, Charlie. The teachers I needed were there at the right time. The opportunities were there at the right time. I couldn't have had more good fortune. I, as a result, of course, I worked very, very hard because I felt um, I, I had to come up to the gift. And uh, I think the spinal cord injury was as close as I ever felt to a real problem that has to be solved. And now, it, uh, uh, two years later, we're, we're looking like um, the doctors and therapists think I can still improve quite a bit because apparently the nerve regeneration is very, very slow, yeah. but uh, it, it is clearly happening. So how do you approach a year now? I mean, we've just begun a new season here. How do you approach it? Do you say... Um, my God, uh, I'm going to choose those things that I'm so passionate about, that I so much want to do, that I so much want to share. Well, it, it would be nice if you could do that, and you do that to some degree. But I think basically what I have to do is I have to move slowly and steadily, increasing, balancing uh, styles of repertoire, things that the company needs, things that I need, which are usually the same, and uh, just keeping us stimulated along the tracks we were on before I, I fell. And, um, the, and it's tricky because 
planning is done several years in exactly. advance. And um, so many people ask me how I chose these three operas exactly. from this That's season. It question. wasn't really like that. <laughs> yes. It was one by one, the ones I was supposed to conduct, I didn't because it wasn't, I wasn't ready for conducting yet. And when I did, when we projected that we thought it would work, then the best Thing, the best choice and the best layout for me were these three pieces. And that's rather how we're doing it. But we're, are they among your favorite? Or? Oh, always. That's what I thought. <laughs> I, 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 never, I never agree to conduct something that I'm not uh, so close to that I could say it was my favorite while it was going on. It, it's, they're just, there's so much great music, there is no need to conduct something you don't feel the deepest affinity for. Are you finding new things? Always. Are you really? From the old, you know, from Mozart, or are you finding thing, or whoever it might be for you, or you are you finding new the composers is that from both, mm -hmm. from new composers and, but I I do one thing which is a little bit different from some of my colleagues. There are a lot of my colleagues who are in situations where the quantity of new music they can do is greater because if they are head of a symphony orchestra, the turnover is one new program every week. Whereas at the Met, I do three programs with my orchestra in a season because of all the operas and opera rehearsals, and, and, and that, that makes sense to me. That's good. But, uh, when, but And it's always been a kind of... There was always much more great music that I felt close to than there would have been time with three lifetimes yeah, to do. Yeah. And so I, I'm interested in doing some things I haven't done before, and I'm interested in repeating some things that I have done before that I need to do better. And there's a begins to be a small group of things that I think maybe I'll leave alone because I don't think I can do them better or they're not a high enough priority. But uh, there's nothing. I can't imagine this, but I'm going to ask anyway. There's nothing that you wanted to do and you didn't say to yourself, I'm not quite ready for that. Or, or I've I'm, done that I, often. Have you really? Yeah. That it, It's funny because I did some big projects when I was young, but they were things I thought. I learned something from one of my, I told you, all the my great teachers just fell in my lap from the heaven right. like magic. Yeah. And George Zell said to me, you should conduct certain piece it was at that moment the Mozart G minor symphony you you won't really do it well till after you're 40 but do it now exactly and I understood what he meant he, he meant don't try to crack it for yourself new later on down the road and um, I was that way with some pieces and, and I was always a person Charlie who I know what I know but what I don't know is a closed book to me I never was happy with superficial knowledge and I could never just go and hear a performance and feel I was close to the piece at all without really looking at the score, really hearing more performances, really living with it a while. So and, that's and always And to been... do that, are you deep into interpretation in terms of, of where the composer was at that moment, at that time, it, uh, and what was in his head? Yes, I'm into all the things that it takes to try